Thank you for that beautiful music. Someone once told me that the cello was invented by an angel. I've always uh, loved the cello. As I was sitting there watching you come in, one of the thoughts that came to me is, these people are really weird. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I was thinking that, because uh, I have one of my daughters who lives in Michigan, and one day we were talking to our granddaughter who was out, and I asked her what it was like being in a Mormon in a 2600 student high school, and there's only five LDS. And she said, well, let me tell you what happened to me the other day. My best friend, don't even know why, she said, do you go to church? And she said, yeah, I do. How often? Every week. What? Really? Yeah. So how long do you go? For three hours? Three hours? She said, my granddaughter, I just smiled and didn't tell her I also went to early morning seminary at 5.30 five times a week. <laughs> and here you are, spending three days out of your time and paying for it. You're weird. And it's a wonderful weird. As I thought about what to do, I would like to focus on the Savior, particularly one aspect of the Savior. It comes from something he said to Pilate. He said, to this end was I born. I want to use that phrase to talk about what the atoning sacrifice meant to Jesus. But with this particular thing, Jesus, the son of Mary. Let me explain what I mean by that. When we talk about Christ's atoning sacrifice, typically we focus on two things. Number one, we focus on what the atoning sacrifice meant for Jesus as the son of God. He uh, came forward in the great council in heaven. He volunteered to go down and make it possible for us to come back. When war broke out, he was the one who led the battle supporting Heavenly Father. That was who he was as the Son of God. The other thing we typically do is talk about what the atoning sacrifice means to us. Redemption of our sins, his teachings, the great example that he provides, and so on and so on. But there is another dimension that I don't think we very often ask ourselves. And it is this. What did coming to earth mean to the infant Jesus? The boy Jesus? To the adult Jesus? In other words, what we're going to look at today is what did the atoning sacrifice mean to Jesus, the mortal man, not just the Son of God? As I mentioned, these words come from Pilate. When Jesus was arrested by the Jewish leaders, he was accused and convicted of blasphemy. But when they took them to the Romans, to Pilate, they couldn't accuse him of that because the Romans would have just laughed at the concept of blasphemy. So they accused him to Pilate of something that got his attention. They accused him of being, claiming to be the king of the Jews. As Pilate interviewed him, this is what the record says. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. That's the old English way of saying, yes, you say that correctly. And then notice these words of Jesus. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. So I ask you, to what end? Is it just to be a king? And for what cause did he come into the world? 
was it to be tried and crucified, which was about to happen? Or is there something more that Jesus was saying to Pilate, which just went right over Pilate's head? We're going to look at five scriptural phrases that I think provide some important insights into Christ's life as a mortal human being. He was always the Son of God, but he was also a mortal human being. Number one, knowest thou the condescension of God? Now we're going to go through these each separately. Number two, I, God, have suffered these things for all. The third, just two words, Abba, Father. Number four, the phrase, a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And number five, ye must be born again. We're going to spend a lot of time on that one. So what we're going to do is look at the implications of these passages for us. As Nephi reminded us in the Book of Mormon, we should liken all scriptures unto ourselves, which means we should ask ourselves, as President Benson said, when we come to a passage, so what inspired Mormon or Nephi or Joseph Smith to write that passage? And number two, what does that mean for me? What, am I, what do I take out of that to change my life? So let's start with, knowest thou the condescension of God? This comes from Nephi's vision in the Book of Mormon. As you remember, Nephi starts this vision, and he has an escort, and then angels begin to appear to him. And one of the angels opened up a vision, and he saw a woman. And then the woman had a child. And the angel said unto me, Nephi, what beholdest thou? And I said unto him, a virgin, most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. And the angel said, that's right. No, he didn't. He said, knowest thou the condescension of God? That's an odd response in that interchange. Condescension is defined as to voluntarily leave one's rank and position to descend to a significantly, significantly lower rank or position. Sometimes we use it in a negative sense, oh, he's so condescending, but the basic meaning is to descend from where you were. So what was it? that caused the angel to ask Nephi that question, knowest thou the condescension of God? I'm going to suggest several reasons. Number one, perhaps the angel knew the same things that God had taught Moses many centuries earlier. And let's start with that passage in Moses 1. This is what God says, worlds without number, have I created, and by the Son I created them. We know that Christ was the creator. Innumerable are they unto man. The heavens they are many, and they cannot be numbered, but they are numbered unto me, for they are mine. And again he says, and by the word of my power have I created them, which is mine only begotten Son. So Christ is the creator. And he created innumerable worlds. To give you a feeling of appreciation for that, right now astronomers are estimating there may be about 200 billion galaxies in the world, or in the universe, with each galaxy having about 100 billion stars. Want to know how many stars that is? It's one with 56 zeros. Just to give you appreciation of that, here's a, a picture of the night sky that shows the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. Now, they're exaggerated, of course. But if you uh, look at the bowl of the Big Dipper and focus on that part of the night sky with the Mount Pal Palomar Telescope, a 100-inch telescope in California, in the bowl of the Big Dipper, you can see more than a million galaxies, not stars, galaxies. 
just in that little portion of the sky. Enoch, who saw this in vision too, tried to capture and help us understand just how big that is. He says, and were it possible that man could number the particles of the earth, yea, millions of earths like this, it would not be a beginning to the number of his creations. Let's uh, just help you appreciate that. I'm going to give you a task. We're going to start when we talk about the particles. Let's start with sand particles, okay? So we're going to put you on a beach. You can choose anywhere you want, Southern California. And then we're going to have you count every single sand particle. Starting at the far end of that beach and you work all the way down. And then you continue on and count every grain of sand on every beach in every continent in the world. We'll give you the day off. (laughs) And then we'll do the deserts next. That's the Sahara, the Gobi, the Chihuahuan, all the deserts of the world. And that's not counting pebbles or dust particles or any of that. Oh, and we do have this other kind of particle we ought to consider. Imagine if he meant subatomic particles. And millions of Earths like this would not be the beginning of that creation. And what we are saying is that the man, the creator, who said, let there be light and galaxies began to form, left all of that for this. A tiny infant totally dependent on others who had to have his diapers changed, who had to be fed, who when he got to be a boy in the carpenter shop, if he slipped and hit his thumb, it hurt and turned black, well, probably lost his fingernail. He's a human being. Knowest thou the condescension of God? That's the first one. Here's another. If you look at those two pictures, I think a scripture will come to mind, right? Foxes have holes and the birds of the air have their have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Near as we can tell, Jesus never owned a home, never paid rent, never had a place to call his own. He either stayed with people or he slept out of doors. This is the creator of the world. Knowest thou the condescension of God? And here's another. Nephi says, speaking of the trial of Jesus, and the world because of their iniquity shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Imagine that. The creator of the universe and they think he's a nothing, a cipher, a zero. Wherefore they scourged him and he suffereth it. They smite him and he suffereth it. They spit upon him, and he suffereth it because of his loving kindness and long suffering towards the children of men. I emphasize that verb every time. Why does Nephi choose the word suffer it instead of endure it? What choice did he have? I mean, he's bound. He's got guards right behind him. What else could he do? Well, I can tell you one thing he could have done knowing who he was. When that man spit in his face, he could have just lifted his finger and pointed at him, and our whole galaxy could have gone out of existence. That's the power he controlled. But he didn't. He just stood there and suffered it. Knowest thou the condescension of God? This is what it means that he came from where he did and did what he did. Let's go to our next scripture. I, God, have suffered these things for all. This comes from the section 19 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and this is Christ himself speaking. I, God, I, God, have suffered these things for all that they might not suffer if they would repent. Again, let me ask you, what does he mean by these things? Well, we know in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
And I won't read this, but he went, left his disciples, then he went farther into the garden, and there he knelt to pray. And his opening part of the prayer was to beg the Father to let this pass, because he knew what was coming, that he was going to have to pay the price. And so deep was that price that when it began, Luke tells us, and there appeared an angel from heaven, strengthening him, strengthening the Son of God so he can endure. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Much of the Christian world thinks that's a metaphor, that his agony caused him to sweat, and in the darkness it looked like drops of blood. We know different than that. Mosiah says, Lo, he shall suffer temptations and pain of body and thirst, even more than man can suffer. Christ had the power over death. The suffering he endured that caused his blood vessels to rupture. Every blood vessel is so intensely painful that they begin to rupture, and so he's oozing blood. That should be because of his anguish for the wickedness and abominations. No mortal man could have endured that and lived. So Christ just says with his power, hang on, you will not die. That is an amazing thing. Nephi puts it this way, actually Jacob. He suffereth the pains of all men, every living creature, men, women, and children, who belong to the family of Adam. And then in the Doctrine and Covenants in that same passage, he specifically says that this suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore. Elder Maxwell says this, love his insights. The agony though anticipated by him from pre-mortal times, he knew this was coming. Apparently was so much worse than even Jesus had imagined. Later in Gethsemane, the suffering Jesus began to be, this is a quote from the scriptures, sore amazed. Elder Maxwell points out that that means awestruck or astonished. Imagine Jehovah, the creator of this and other worlds, astonished. And then this is a really critical sentence. Jesus knew cognitively what he must do. He knew it up here, what was coming. But he had no idea experientially what it was going to be like. It was so much worse than even he with his unique intellect ever imagined because the cumulative weight of all mortal sins pressed upon that perfect, sinless, and sensitive soul. Let me just give you an appreciation for that. Knowing where we are now in the culture of secularism, how many people cohabit either before they marry or never marry at all, how many times do you think in the history of the world, including the future of the world, will God have to, will Christ have to suffer for fornication and adultery, for child abuse, for genocide, for all that the wicked men of the world have done. But that's not all he suffered for. Here is a great insight from John. You remember the man born blind? When they brought him to Jesus, the Pharisees trying to trap him said, so who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. If he was born blind, he had to have done something wrong, or somebody had to have done something wrong, because it's not fair, where the rest of us are not. And Jesus, as you know, said, said, neither one. Let me help you appreciate that. There are many things that come to our lives that are negatives that we don't get to choose. They're not because we made bad choices. So let me run you through this little question and answer. If you had a choice, would you choose this or this? Would you choose this or this? 
Would you choose this or this? This or this? I hope you can see that man's one arm. I assume he's a thalidomide baby. No arm. This, wonderful marriage in the temple, or a life of being a single woman. The point is, we don't get to choose those things. They just happen to us. And there are so many inequities in the world. So, so many injustices, so many wrongs, so many things we're forced to endure that we had no choice over. So my question is, who's going to pay for those things? Who puts those things right? Well, we know from Alma chapter 7 that there is a payment made by Jesus. He talks about suffering for our pains and our infirmities. Even more clear is in Isaiah 53, what is called the suffering servant passage. In the King James Version, it says this, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. But in the Hebrew Bible, look how it's translated. He is despised and rejected of man, of men, a man of pains, not sorrow, and acquainted with diseases. And he hath borne our pains and carried our diseases. Elder Maxwell, again. In addition to bearing our sins, Jesus came to know our sicknesses, griefs, pains, and infirmities personally and perfectly. He not only suffered for the sins of adultery, he suffered for the suffering of cancer and multiple sclerosis, and all the other things that we are placed upon, are placed upon us in life because that's what he did. And that's why it had to be an infinite atonement. I love this scripture in the book of Revelation. It has new meaning when we understand this aspect of Christ's atonement. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, nor pain. That is what he accomplished for us in the garden. Now let's quickly look at these two words, Abba, Father. In Matthew and Luke, they just talk about Jesus praying to the Father in the garden and saying, Father, let this cup pass from me. But Mark adds two words. And Jesus said, Abba, Father. What does that mean? In Aramaic, Aramaic, Ab is the word for father. We see it in the name Abraham. Abba is the diminutive form of that word. If you were, you know what I mean by diminutive? My name's Gerald, I go by Jerry. Jerry's my diminutive. It's a shortened form. Abba is a term of endearment typically used by young children of their father. In English, if you were to translate it, it would be either daddy or papa. Why didn't the translators just translate it that way? Because this is a sacred name and what we're saying is, Father is a more formal title. Abba is the title a young child uses of its father. Here's what Elder Maxwell says about this. The Abba experience in Gethsemane also affirms that Jesus had a special relationship with God. You ever thought about that, that in the pre-mortal world, he was the firstborn. You know how parents feel about their firstborn. That Jesus called his father daddy. It sounds gross to us because we don't think of God in that way, but that's how it was. The suffering Jesus there addressed God as Abba, meaning father dear. Then the last sentence, in the extremity of his suffering 
At this time when he's in the greatest agony, he beseeched his father, calling him Abba, to take that cup from him. Why should that matter to us? Because the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans said that if we become the children of God spiritually, it will be our privilege to call him Abba, Father that we will have that same privilege of Christ. It's a wonderful, I'm not suggesting that we use that in our daily prayer. It's a very sacred term. But I think the implications of what's coming for us is remarkable. Let's talk for a moment about a broken heart. This has to do with the crucifixion. There's some things about the crucifixion that we don't commonly understand. First of all, it was devised by the Assyrians, not the Romans. The Romans just perfected it. Secondly, it was specifically designed not to hasten death, but to prolong death. The typical victim lived up to five to six days on the cross. They typically died of either thirst or exhaustion. It was designed that way. It is a horrible way. When they pierced the nail through the wrist, it pierced what they call the great median nerve. They had to do that or else it would just tear the flesh of the palms. But that was so intensely painful that it contracts the chest muscle so violently that a person can actually suffocate because he cannot breathe anymore. Well, the Romans didn't want that. That makes death come too quickly. So they, in their kindness... Quote, they would actually build a small seat, just, just about that much, where the person could sit, and then they put little blocks down at his feet so that when the contraction on his chest became so unbearable, they would actually stand on the nails in their feet to relieve that pressure. It was a horribly fiendish way to die. So, Here's John's account. The Jewish leaders went to Pilate after the crucifixion had happened and asked Pilate if the legs of the prisoners might be broken. Let me explain that. Because the the prisoners lived that long on the cross, and because this was a Sabbath day coming, the Jewish leaders, who didn't mind crucifying the Son of God, couldn't bear to leave him hanging on the cross on the Sabbath, because that would violate their law. So they begged Pilate that his soldiers would go break their legs. Why? Because when you broke the shins, take just a sledgehammer and broke both of the shins of the victim, he could no longer stand on his feet and relieve the pain. So the the soldiers came, as Pilate granted, And when they came to the first two prisoners, they found that they were already dead. No, I I said that wrong. They broke their legs so that they would die. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. After three hours, he was dead, a young, healthy male. And this so surprised them that this seems to be what happened. One of the soldiers, wanting to make sure that this was not being feigned or whatever, reached up with his spear and pierced his side, and then John says, out came blood and water. Brother Talmage, his death in this manner, the blood and water, points to a physical rupture of the heart as the direct cause of death. If the soldier's spear was thrust into the left side of the Lord's body, and actually penetrated the heart, the outrush of blood and water, which is really a kind of a serum mixture that resides in that heart cavity. The outrush of blood and water observed by John is further evidence of cardiac rupture. The present writer believes that the Lord Jesus died of a broken heart. Why? Because James Talmage says that on the cross, Jesus again suffered what he suffered in the garden. And then you remember at that point, 
suddenly God abandoned him so that he can make that atonement all by himself. And so if Christ died for us, does it really matter whether he died by crucifixion or the broken heart? Yeah, notice some of these scriptures. Notice the second scripture. If a man will come after me, let him take up his cross. Now, there's a grim image for us. I don't think he's saying be crucified. I think he's saying you better be willing to even pay for education week (laughs) instead of getting it free where everybody else does. And then comes this from the Doctrine and Covenants. Thou shalt offer unto the Lord thy God in righteousness a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Let's look at what this means. Oh, I went one slide too far. Too far. Whoops. I'm getting there. Now, yeah. in the scriptures, it also says you must be born again. Remember when Alma, the younger, went through that suffering that he endured? When he came out of it, he said, you must be born again. All mankind, every man, woman, and child must be born again. In the Pearl of Great Price, again in the book of Moses, this is Enoch speaking, he likens this spiritual rebirth, this being born again, to our birth in mortality. Notice this, he says, Inasmuch as you were born into the world by water and blood and spirit, which I have made, and so become of dust a living soul, even so, meaning in the same way, you must be born again into the kingdom of heaven of water and blood and spirit. So let's explore what that means. When we are born, there are three elements that are required if we are to have a healthy birth. First of all, it starts with water. It's called the amniotic fluid, but we call it water. What's the one sure sign that birth is imminent? We say the woman's water has broken. So that was how we lived the first nine months of our life, totally immersed. Second is blood. Somewhere around the fifth week of life, the heart is operating and is pumping blood to that little tiny body. And notice what three functions blood uh, fills for our body. Number one, it brings nourishment. It carries the nourishment to the cells. Number two, it draws out impurity through the white blood cells, right? It's where we get our immunity. And three, it provides that immunity from sin as well. The third element required is the spirit. If the spirit is not placed in the body, and we don't know exactly what time that takes place, then at birth we have what we call a stillborn child. Now this is the primary teaching, I think, that we get from Jesus' mortal life. Let me talk about the fall, the birth and the fall, of what I'm going to call the innocent me. Now this is a diagram, I'm going to go through it slowly. It's very full of imagery and symbolism. So, when I was born, I I was innocent, right? In fact, we're told that specifically in the Doctrine and Covenants, that when when we came into an infant state here, we were innocent before God. I'm not sure what we did in the pre-mortal world that we had to get fixed, but all of us were absolutely innocent. The proof of that is if you die before the age of eight and reach accountability, where do you go? Straight back into the celestial kingdom because your no sins are counted against you. But I didn't die when I was eight. I was born. So when I reached the age of accountability, for me about eight years old, like most of us, what did I choose to do? I chose to do wrong. First it was pretty harmless, then it got more serious. And I've been doing it ever since. Right? And here's the bad news. So have you. 
So when I send this innocent me, this is my choice, right? No one forced me to do this. But now I am spiritually unclean. That means, because of this law, no unclean thing can dwell in God's presence. And if I am separated from God, we have a word for that, right? We call it spiritual death. To be separated from God is spiritual death. So when I sinned, the innocent me died. Now you see, I'm talking metaphorically. And a new me was born. The scriptures have a name for this person. It's called the natural man or the natural me. Sisters, I'm sorry to say there's also natural women. So this new sinful person was born. And how am I described? In these words, I'm carnal. Now that's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, For some reason, carnal has come to be associated with sex today, but it's actually from the Latin word, which if you go to a Mexican restaurant and see on the menu carne, what are you getting? Meat. So the carnal means the physical body. I am sensual, which means I see, I hear. The five senses is how I learn most things in the world. And I'm devilish because I am now subject to the temptations of Christ. And this makes me an enemy to God in that I can no longer return to his presence. So now this natural me is functioning and has been functioning. I am now, according to the scriptures, under the bondage of sin and I lose, to some degree, the spirit. Alma says, the devil can have power over me and likens this to the chains of hell. I don't like this person. And what do I do? Unfortunately, I've never seen the natural man die a natural death. Something has to intervene to make this possible. And that is found in the power of the atonement. How did Christ do it? Because he paid for that first sin I committed when I was eight years old, and every one since. He paid the price as though he were guilty of it. And out of that comes the power of the atonement. So this is how we put the natural me to death. Okay, Again, speaking metaphorically. As you can see, I'm pretty lively still. Now that brings us back to Jesus. Jesus says, come follow me. How did he die? Of a broken heart, right? So the natural me has to die of a broken heart. And here's how that happens. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 to 10 Paul talks about godly sorrow as compared to the sorrow of the world. A person can do wrong and feel terrible because they're caught, because they go to jail, because they get themselves in trouble, because they get lung cancer. But godly sorrow is a different kind of sorrow. It's the sorrow that comes from the realization that the things that I have done wrong were part of what caused the suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross for Jesus Christ, as well as causing suffering for others. So I have created this great debt by my behavior. But godly sorrow is what breaks the natural man's heart. So the natural man dies of a broken heart. Just so you think this is not just me, here's President Benson. True repentance involves a change of heart and not just a change of behavior. Part of this mighty change of heart is to feel godly sorrow for our sins. This is what is is meant by a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So, if I use that power of the atonement and have faith and repentance, then the natural me dies. So, 
We now have a dead body on, my, on our hands, right? What do you do with a dead body? You bury it. And where do you bury it? Notice what Paul says. He uses this imagery. Where do we bury this dead natural me? Why, in the grave, of course. Which is the baptismal font. Notice what Paul says, we are planted together in the likeness of his death. Doctrine and Covenants 128, this is one we don't talk about much, but this is specific from Joseph Smith by revelation. The baptismal font was instituted as a similitude of the grave and was commanded to be in a place underneath where the living are wont to assemble to show forth the living and the dead that all things have their likeness. You know what he's saying? If you look in virtually every stake center where we have a baptismal font, you look carefully. Some, this isn't always possible, but it's always below ground level to carry that symbolism. And uh, we're running out of time, so I'll just... Romans 6, write that down. Paul takes this whole imagery and explores it in a beautiful way. Romans 6, 3 and 6. So... I now bury the natural me in the baptismal font, and with the natural me dead, guess what is born again? The innocent me, because my sins are washed away, right? And they've been atoned for. And I am not just born, I am born again, this innocent me. By water, blood, blood. And spirit. Remember the three elements? Well, they are present here too. Water, as I was when I was born, I am totally immersed in water. So not only is the baptismal font a symbol of the grave, it is simultaneously a symbol of the womb, where I come forth, and by the blood of Christ, I now. Get nourishment, cleansing, and he fortifies me against sin. And of course, I don't want a stillborn spiritual me, so I have to have the Holy Ghost. Now, one last question. I have this newborn spiritual me, thanks to the atonement of Christ that he brought about as a mortal man. What do I feed this person? Well, there's one thing. That sound familiar? Feast upon the words of Christ. Notice that. Not snack, not nibble, not even dine. Feast upon the words of Christ. Anything else I can feed this newborn person? Yes, every Sunday. I go into the sacrament, covenant, and I partake of his body and blood which brings the atonement into my life through covenant making and keeping. But I want this newborn person to also have power. How do I bring that about? I endow him with power from on high in the temples of God. Brothers and sisters, this is the beautiful symbolism we find in the atonement made by Jesus Christ, the mortal man. And how do we wrap it up? We live so that someday we will hear these wonderful words from the Master. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Way to go for going to Education Week. Way to go for being faithful, for paying your tithing, for raising righteous children. That's what it means to endure to the end. So, let me close with this. I believe that in addition to being a king, which he was, and in addition to sacrificing himself on the cross, which he did, that when he said, to this end I was born, 
And to this, for this cause came I into the world, I think he is specifically talking about so that we could be born again into the kingdom of God. That is what it means to me to know what Jesus did when he came into mortality and lived as we live. That is my testimony of who we worship. And I bear witness of that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.